Hello everybody. everybody. Welcome to the Högre Seminariet. This is the, uh, the highest seminar in a joint collaboration with CDR and the part and the part of history. So we are very happy today to have this special guest, our special guests from a land far, far away in the West. <laughs> uh, so the, the title for this seminar is A Jar of Potato Salad Saved Lives, the Legacy of the White Plus Rescue Actions in March to May. 1945. I will begin to by introducing our speakers here, beginning with Roger, Roger Rico, um, PhD, uh, holds the title of Distinguished Research Professor at Auburn University, Montgomery, Montgomery yes, correct. <laughs> uh, and he was presented with the Teaching Excellence Award in the College of Business for the 2013 and 2014 academic year. He uh, has a long CV, <laughs> has also served as a lecturer in the health and administration programs at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. And he has a lot of uh, different um, faculty and, 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 and administrative roles at a number of universities here. I will, I will not read them out for you, but uh, at the end of this paragraph, it stands, he has served as a senior policy advisor to two secretaries of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. And current research focuses on the Swedish Red Cross rescue over, of over 15,000 prisoners from the Nazis in the last weeks of the World War II. And this builds on his Holocaust research and book entitled Sisters in Sorrow, uh, published by Texas and University, uh, A.M. University Press. Uh, his renowned scholarship has focused on the NGOs in the post Soviet life societies. He has been a visitor scholar at the Ukrainian Catholic University in 2017, and was, I was previously selected twice as a Fulbright scholar in Azerbaijan 2005, and then to the former Soviet Republic of Georgia 2012. Uh, additional research and teaching have been in Latvia, Poland 2014. Uh, he's a prolific, pro pro prolific author, sorry for the pronunciation, but it's difficult. Professor Ipo has, has published nine books and numerous articles, including many co-authored with colleagues and several with students. Uh, yes, I will end there. Uh, we are very happy to have you here, and I will also introduce Richard. Richard, Richard, either one. <laughs> Born in Lund. Yeah, yes. And... Um, He's, uh, he's been living in the USA for since the 1980s, and he's uh, an entrepreneur. And he's been a collaborator with Oslo Georgia, and he's the, the president of the, for the foundation Better Futures. We will talk a more about the yeah, work at this foundation. And he has collaborated with Roger for the last two or three years. Uh, last year. That last year only. But this is uh, something quite new. And also this story, this history of the wife, Buses is something rather unusual or totally unknown in the US. So that's why this is happening, uh, this collaboration. And uh, you will tell us more about this foundation and your work. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. And, and Roger we begin. I think I'm going to begin. You will begin. Yeah, I'll break the ice. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome all of you. And I'd like to thank the University Foundation, Lund University. I'm sorry. Uh, on behalf of Roger, myself, Roger is a board member of Better, Better Futures, and I'd like to thank specifically Deepika uh, Kalbe and Alexander Moritz for arranging this this uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Um, another thank you goes to Luis and Marcus from Capital Stulan, who is responsible for the exhibit that you saw in the hallway as you were coming in. It was actually work that their students accomplished based on the Ravensbrück archive a few years ago and connected us 2016 or 17, I think it was. So so uh, uh, thanks for being here, Bruce. Uh, again, I'm Richard Olson. I was born here in Lund uh, and uh, I moved to the US in the early 1980s. Uh, I I'm an entrepreneur, thank you. Uh, I was not aware of the white buses myself until a close friend of mine, Robert Resnick, 
from Los Angeles introduced me. He asked me two questions in December 2014. He asked me, have you heard about the white buses or have you heard about the Ravensbrück archive? And I said no to both of those. And saying that today, I feel rather stupid. Uh, this event happened here and I had no, had no knowledge about it. I talked to some of my friends from school back in Kroger where I went to, to high school. And they remember clearly that the white bus came to our school and uh, I apparently was not attending school that day. <laughs> um, in 2015, I joined the Lund University Foundation, which is based in Los Angeles. And I joined them in the fundraising to raise funds for the translation and the digitization of the Ravensbrück archive that's now visible online. More about that later. And I organized my first uh, presentation or fundraising event in Sarasota at the Jewish Federation in the summer of 2015. And the executive director there told me that you can use our facility, but if you get eight people to your presentation, you should be happy. It was a summer in Florida. Most people, they go north in the summer. Uh, so I said, no worries. If I can touch one soul the way I was touched by this incredible, inspiring story, I'm fine. And we had 350 people attending. So I like to rub that in every time I see him. <laughs> uh, at that time, we had actually Hokan Hokan, an associate pr professor from the Lund University Library, attend, and he brought a few items with him to, to the presentation at our fundraising. Uh, at the very end of the presentation uh, in June of 2015, we took the Q and A's, and there was two individual, two 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 individuals standing up in the audience, uh, totally unrelated to each other, and they thanked me for them being alive. Apparently, their grandparents or some relatives there had been rescued by the white buses, and I, as a Swedish person on stage, was their connection to that historic event that gave them life. Uh, I was quite stunned and I didn't really know how to react to that gratitude from them. It took me a few days to absorb it and digest it. And a few days later, I decided to sell my business and focus on the women from Ravensburg and give them their voices back, which was happened to be our slogan for the fundraising event that, that took a few years. And uh, my research continued and I was always wondering how could these 36 white buses suddenly rescue over 15,000 Holocaust victims in such a short time. And where did they all start? And I researched and researched, and it did start with a jar of potato salad back in the fall of 1942. Uh, just a small disclaimer before I continue. Uh, you will hear various numbers of rescued during this, this uh, 54 days of, this, of the uh, spring of 1945. I will try to clarify it and we can always answer questions if there's questions afterwards. Um, this just shows a map uh, of Europe in January of 1944. This is a point of reference. This is how it looked in Sweden, of course, as we know, was neutral. And uh, Norway up on top and Denmark was was um, occupied by the Nazis. Uh, this shows many of the major camps. We'll get into that later. I just want to show this as a point of reference for all of us so we know where it all took place. Uh, so the story again begins with the jar of potato salad in November 1942. Uh, this jar is actually from a farm outside Trondheim that was occupied by the Nazis. It's the real thing. The potato salad is not real. <laughs> uh, you will get to meet Wanda Jort, a 20-year-old Norwegian held under house arrest in, in, uh, by the Nazis uh, outside, outside Berlin. You will get to meet Count Folke Bernadotte, the Swedish diplomat and vice president of the Swedish Red Cross. You will get to meet two of the volunteers, Sven and Karl, two young brave men that risked their lives for rescuing uh, strangers to them by risking their life. You will also get to meet Zygmunt Lakosinski, the founder or the creator of the Ravensbrück archive. So Wanda Jurt, she was a 20 year old Norwegian, young and brave, and together with her empathy and compassion, her actions made it possible 
to save thousands of lives at the end of World War II. Next, you're going to hear the story about Wanda. In times of difficulty, true heroes emerge. Heroes sacrifice their time and even their personal safety to help others. United by empathy, their legacies are eternal. This is the story of Wanda Fort Yegen. Wanda, a 21-year-old Norwegian, watched the Germans occupy her country. In October of 1942, Wanda and her family were forced to leave Oslo due to her parents' work in the Norwegian resistance movement. They were forced to live under house arrest in Gostkois, just west of Berlin. Wanda's grandmother was of German descent and from an old noble family, and Wanda's two aunts were married to counts in Germany. Due to their connections, the family was kept out of the regular prison system. Through contacts in the Norwegian church in Hamburg and the Danish church in Berlin, Wanda learned about a growing population of Norwegian prisoners in Sachsenhausen. She and her siblings packed food supplies and traveled to the camp gate, telling the camp guards they had packages for the Norwegian prisoners. Among these supplies were two glass jars of potato salad. Since glass jars were in scarce supply, they said they would be back to pick up the empty jars they ate. This began a weekly routine that led to familiarity with the camp guards. Over time, Wanda was able to pass messages to the Norwegian prisoners working at the packet sorting facility. These messages enabled Wanda and her family to compile lists of Norwegians held in captivity. These lists were sent to the Norwegian government in exile and were essential for the success of the Swedish Red Cross and the White Buses operation. The White Buses operation saved over 15,000 prisoners of various nationalities, including Jews. It is remarkable how something as simple as jars of potato salad led to the rescue of thousands of victims. Just a side note, I forgot to mention the female you hear narrating this video. Uh, her name is Grace. I met her in 2017 when she was a non-believer. She did not believe that the Holocaust had happened. I was able to, to connect with one of my friends, Elsie, that you will meet here in a few minutes. And we, they got together at Elsie's kitchen table. Elsie had been in, in Auschwitz and Ravensburg. And after three hours meeting, Grace, she was convinced that she had been, been misinformed <clears throat> and she wanted to, after spreading <clears throat> this false information on her YouTube channel for hundreds and hundreds of her, her, her friends and, and so forth, she wanted to do something and she offered to help out. And that's why you hear her voice in, the, in this video and a few more videos coming up. Again, her name was Grace and she was 17 years old. This is Wanda on the right, of course, and her husband Bjorn. Uh, Bjorn was one of the first Norwegians <laughs> that she that she ran into when she was handing out potato salad at the different camps in, in the Nazi occupied territory. She was able to to get with her connection, get him out of jail, and he was actually helping her out with with the with the collection of names and so forth. And as soon as the war was over, they got married. This picture is from 1985, shortly before Bjorn Hager uh, passed away. Uh, here at this moment, they were just uh, decorated with a nice first class of the Royal Norwegian Order of St. Olaf for their humanitarian wartime efforts. Uh, yeah, he passed away in 1985. Wanda, she passed away on the International Holocaust Remembrance Day on January 27, 2017. Count Falke Bernadotte, Swedish diplomat and vice president of the Swedish Red Cross. With a list of the 6,000 names that Wanda was able to put together, he was able to organize one of the largest humanitarian rescue efforts in history. Let's meet Falke. In times of difficulty, true heroes emerge. Heroes sacrifice their time and even their personal safety to help others. United by empathy, their legacies are eternal. This is the story of Volke Bernadotte. Count Volke Bernadotte was a Swedish diplomat and vice president of the Swedish Red Cross during World War II. Volke Bernadotte organized the White Bus Rescue Action together with the Danish and the Norwegian exile government. 
a rescue expedition for the Scandinavian concentration camp prisoners had been discussed for some time. During 1944, concrete plans for a rescue action began to take shape in Norway. At the end of August 1944, a brief list of some 6,000 prisoners was submitted to the Swedish Foreign Ministry. World War II was coming to its end between 1944 and 1945. Adolf Hitler ordered to burn the concentration camps, eradicating all evidence. As the war approached the end, many leading Nazis hoped that by negotiating with the Allies through Volker Bernadotte, they would get off with a lighter sentence. In the spring of 1945, Volker Bernadotte met with Heinrich Himmler in Germany. The negotiations resulted in the Swedish Red Cross being able to help organize a rescue operation to repatriate Scandinavian prisoners from the concentration camps. The Swedish Red Cross ran the rescue operation in cooperation with the Swedish military, which contributed equipment and volunteers. Bernadotte was originally assigned to retrieve Norwegian and Danish POWs in Germany. He and his rescue team returned to Malmö, Sweden, on the 1st of May 1945, the day after Hitler's death. Bernadotte succeeded in rescuing approximately 15,000 people from Nazi concentration camps, including about 8,000 Danes and Norwegians, and 7,000 women of French, Polish, Czech, British, and American nationalities. The Swedish Red Cross expeditions from Nazi concentration camps in March and April of 1945 was the largest rescue effort inside Nazi-occupied territory during the war. The White Bus Rescue Action rescued approximately 17,500 Holocaust victims during 54 days in the spring of 1945 before the liberation. The missions took around two months and exposed the Swedish Red Cross staff to significant danger. To avoid being bombed by the Allied Air Force bombing Nazi territory, the buses were painted white. Volker Bernadotte is a true example of a person with fearless determination to rescue human need. As you heard Grace mention there that they, the, the rescue people, the volunteers, they put themselves in very great danger. Roger's going to present some more about that. There was one casualty, which we will hear about from Roger. That's his presentation. I mentioned earlier, you, you will hear a few different numbers of rescued. About 15,000 prisoners came out of the camps. There was another 1,500, give or take, uh, Swedish citizens, so Swedish people living in Germany, uh, married to Germans, that was also rescued. And of course, uh, uh, Wanda York and her family, they were also rescued at the very end, brought back to, to, uh, to Scandinavia uh, when, the, when the war ended. Um, Paul Bernhardt, he met with Heinrich Himmler on a few occasions. Uh, I believe the first meeting was February 19. Uh, initially, Heinrich Himmler, he only allowed the white bus, the 36 white bus, to, to pick up Scandinavian prisoners throughout Nazi occupied territory and bring them to Neuengamme. Neuengamme was a camp just located just south of the Danish border. And that was the first step of the negotiations between uh, Falk and, and uh, Heinrich Himmler. Uh, Himmler's requirement was also they can only bring in about 250 volunteers. They had to bring in own, their own vehicles, their own fuel, food, etc. There was no, no resources in, in uh, Germany during this time, so they had to make sure they got everything with them. And also, each bus had to have one German officer on board to make sure that uh, Himmler's orders was followed. Next, you will see a short clip where we will hear Falcon talk. Swedish Red Cross mission became the biggest rescue mission on German territory during the war. In all, as many as 30,000 people were saved from the concentration camps and came to Sweden. Of those, about 11,000 were Jews. Next 
professor at our data than them from the world. Yes, I'm on our annual For those of you who paid attention, you probably heard another number up to 30,000. I don't mean to confuse you, but the, the official Swedish Red Cross White Bus Rescue Action brought home about 17,500. After the war in the summer, the, the UNRRA requested for Sweden to take additional 10,000 prisoners. Uh, so all together, it was close to 30,000. Uh, the 10,000, I think it was 9,800 something that, that came into Sweden uh, during the summer. They arrived Sweden by buses, some of them white uh, trains and also white ships that we are now studying more. It's coming, coming more, more information about that. Um, you will see the same map as I showed earlier. Again, this is from January 1944. You see the front line, the yellow line between Soviet Union and the Nazi occupied territory was over there at that, that point. We know that a year later, at January 27, 1945, uh, Auschwitz, located right here, had been liberated by the, by the Allied, uh, Allied forces. So the front line had moved over here, and the Nazis were losing quite a bit of land. And I just want to point out a few of the camps where the white buses. Uh, picked up uh, Scandinavian prisoners, as prisoners from Dachau, Mauthausen, Buchenwald, and Ravensbrück, and Sachsenhausen. And here you see Neuengamme, that's the camp just south of the Danish border where Himmler allowed the, the rescue people bringing the, the, the uh, rescue to first, prior to them being able to, to go into to Denmark and to the freedom in Sweden. Ben and Carl, they got to see firsthand some of the worst atrocities created by mankind, the Holocaust. No one could have prepared them, but based on interviews and diaries published, many of them have shared that they could not see themselves not have done what they did. Uh, the rescue action became their, their life story. In times of difficulty, true heroes emerge. Heroes sacrifice their time and even their personal safety to help others. United by empathy, their legacies are eternal. This is the story of Sven Allard and Carl Carlson. Sven Allard and Carl Carlson were two young adventurous Swedish men who volunteered on a somewhat secret mission. They met in March of 1945 when Falco Bernadotte brought all the volunteers together. In 1943, Sven Allard started working at the Royal Military Anti-Aircraft Corps in Malmö. During his time there, he worked in another military regiment in Haslaholm, about 55 miles northeast from Malmö. At this regiment in 1945, Captain Perchon informed Sven about a secret mission into Germany to rescue prisoners. The captain thought Sven would be a good fit for the job. Sven was very interested in getting involved. Sven drove bus number 27 during the whole rescue action, first with Carl and then alone when Carl became a motorcycle driver. After May 1st, 1945, Sven continued his regular work at the Royal Military Anti-Aircraft Corps until December 31st, 1945. Later on, he worked for the Swedish Red Cross and the Swedish section of the International Organization Save the Children. At the time when Folke Bernadotte was looking for volunteers, Carl Carlson was unemployed. Carl was eager to help people in need while making a living. He was supposed to drive one of the 36 buses, but after the first rescue, he couldn't stomach the sight of the Holocaust victims. Many of them were malnourished, sick, and covered in bugs. Carl was transferred to the motorcycle crew and led the buses through the night. Carl didn't share his experience until the 1980s when he talked about it with his children. Through the story of Sven and Carl, we learned that a huge difference could be made when people come together as a team and take action. Both Sven and Carl are deceased, uh, but I'm very fortunate to be working with Sven's wife, Astrid Allard, who is a member of the White Bus group in Malmö. 
uh, together with Samuel that I'm looking at right now. Thank you for inspiration, Samuel. Mm -hmm. um, Carl Carlson, uh, I met with his children who happens to live in my hometown, Welburg. Uh, so I'm getting very personally close to this story because of those people that I have met or the relatives. Let's visit Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück concentration camp was a camp about 55 miles north of Berlin. It was built to a, a store, a store but, but it was built for women and children only. It was a labor camp. Uh, about 130,000 women from 20 plus different nations entered this camp. About 92,000 did not leave that camp alive. It was one of the deadliest camps uh, after the extermination camps. Uh, one thing that really caught my attention was when I found out that it was only about 50% of the inmates that was Jewish. I had lived in my little bubble, thought that the Holocaust only affected the Jewish population, but I was wrong. Um, it was opened in May of 1939, and it was liberated by the Red Army on April 30th. Uh, this camp also functioned as a training camp for female Nazi guards. They were trained here and sent to other camps after the training was over with. Uh, there was medical experiments conducted here. And then um, on the right there, you see the, the in the middle. Uh, I lost my words here. Uh, you see that on, on the left, you see a building, two-story building, which was actually a, a prison within the concentration camp. The building in the middle was a crematorium. On the right, you see a wall, and right behind that wall was the barracks. This was very close to a small, peaceful city uh, north of Berlin. And um, I was there myself in the, in the fall last year and walking from the train station to the camp, you can just wonder what was going on in people's minds that lived just on the other side of the lake. Somehow they must have known what was going on. Uh, Siemens had a factory just outside this camp where many of the inmates worked. Uh, Next, you will get to meet one of the survivors that actually spent two years in the prison building just, just next to the crematorium. You know, from our window, we, uh, there was a crematorium where the dead bodies were burned. And you could smell every day. Sometimes when they took us to um, uh, interrogation, which were seldom, at the beginning was uh, closer, and then it was seldom. You never knew if it was going to interrogation or if they will take you someplace and put you and take you to crematorium. I mean, the feelings we have it's hard to describe, but you are just you are just there. That's it. You don't know what's going to happen in the next minute. We have just met Ivana Olavati, a woman from Ukraine, Roman Catholic, has spent two years as a political prisoner, uh, as she has stated, in the prison right outside the crematorium at Ravenskrupp concentration camp. She happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. The Nazis was, were looking for her cousin's husband. And when he wasn't home, the Nazis arrested Ivana, her cousin, and the cousin's two-year-old son. In early April, uh, some of the uh, Swedish volunteers had to return to Sweden, but Volker Bernhardt got the help from the Danish Red Cross about 450 people joined the expedition with many buses. Uh, the Swedish 36 white buses took care of the collection of prisoners in the Nazi occupied territory, brought them to Neuengamme, and eventually the Danish uh, rescue team, they brought them from Neuengamme to Sweden through Denmark. Uh, on April 19, there was an order suddenly arrives that all the Scandinavians in the Neuengamme camp shall be transported to Denmark. And during 
24 hours, about 4,200 people were moved from Noyengamba to, to the moment of liberation. The last meeting between Himmler and Bernadotte was late night, uh, April 22nd, early morning of April 23rd. Uh, Himmler knows that the end is coming, the war is coming to an end, of course, and he tells Bernadotte, take as many as you can. At this time, the Red Army was getting very close to Ravensbrück, and the rumor of what happened to the women when the, Red, when the Red Army came in wasn't too good. So Bernadotte organized all the trucks, all his vehicles, all his men to, to focus on, on, on uh, Ravensbrück. So this is what Elsie Ragusin saw on the morning of April 24, when the buses pulled into Ravensbrück. You're gonna hear from her story the day of her liberation. I went outside and they told me you have to go online. Everybody's getting ready to go on the transport. <laughs> so I went, but I was frightened. I said, I mean, where are we going? I thought, you know. And then all of a sudden we saw the white buses coming. And we thought, well, then now we thought they take you to the crematory, you know? I said, oh my God, now what? So we went and uh, I thought I'm like, oh, but then I saw the cross on the bus, and then these people coming out and came to greet us, and uh, and I remember them saying, we 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 are Swede, we are Swedish, but still I just didn't trust anybody, and then they gave cigarettes out. I said, it was something new that never happened before, and I don't smoke anyway. I said no, but the girls. Didn't want to take it, they were afraid, and some took it. And then they started giving a little, little something, a biscuit or something. I was afraid to take it. And they tried to calm us down, and some started crying because they thought they were going to take us from elsewhere. And I just, you know, then finally, after we calmed down a little bit, they took us to the door. And I sat in the very front, I remember that, the very front seat, and they put a little package on my lap. And each one, as we came in, we sat and they put a package on each one's lap. And we opened and I had little cookies, a little biscuit or something. And the women just couldn't believe they started eating. But then we, they were crying and eating and just laughing. and trying at the same time, we just couldn't believe it. It was just so emotional and so terrible. It, it was just an unbelievable feeling. And then I saw the gates open as the buses start coming on, and they saw these big gates open, and we were going outside of the camp. And then, my God, we still couldn't believe it. I said, oh my, where are we going? Where are they taking us? We went on to Denmark, we arrived at Denmark. <laughs> and that's when we went off the bus and they were waiting for us. The people there were so wonderful. They waited for us. As we came in, they asked us to come in. They had a big, heavy, long table set with a white tablecloth. Go down the table. I oh, couldn't believe it. I see this table and they asked us to sit down. And we started to eat, and they gave us a little bit of food, and we were so hungry. And we started to eat, and tears were crying and eating, and the people were so wonderful. We went on to the bus again, and then the boat, Swedish boat at the harbor waited for us. And then we went to the rousing or whatever, and then we went to a shower. And that's where I went under the shelf and I see this water coming down. And I said, oh my God, water, you know? And it was so beautiful. And uh, then from there, they took us to the hospital. And then they examined us and some had remained there because they were sick. They had typhoid or some died of uh, tuberculosis. And the rest of us went on. They took us to a factory. And uh, the owner told us to pick our dress, a coat, and uh, underwear, which I didn't have. 
and shoes. And we thought, but just what is this going on? Well, you know, we're sort of wonderful. I know we were so happy we couldn't believe what was going on finally. You have just met Elsie Ragusin, an American born Roman Catholic. She was visiting her grandparents in Italy, uh, in Lucin Piccolo, in the summer of 44. Her and her father was arrested by the Nazis. The Nazis accused them of being American spies. Apparently her father was out smoking in the middle of the night, and the Nazis thought he was sending signals with a rolling cigarette to the Allied uh, forces. Uh, her father, Giovanni, was sent to Buchenwald, where he passed away on February 28th, 1945, just a few weeks prior to the liberation by the American forces. Elsie, she was sent to Auschwitz, and she was later on, late 1944, transferred to Ravensburg, mm -hmm. where she was rescued, as we just heard. Uh, you can also see Elsie, she's in this movie called Every Face Has a Name by Magnus Gerton. Uh, I recommend anybody to see that film. Elsie, she lived to be 100 years and two days old. And I was very fortunate to be by her side at the last breath. We just see the, the chart that the Nazis created for her father, Giovanni Ragusin, and he shows the day when he passed away, 28th of February, 1945. There is five existing white buses <laughs> left. We have one outside Malmö Museum on display 24 seven. We have one at the museum in Denmark. We have one at the Baldwin Museum in Gothenburg. And we have one in Yad Vashem. That's currently being renovated, and I've been told by our contacts there, Yad Vashem in, in Israel, that their, their renovation, that bus is going to be done, finished up this summer, was going to be a, a bigger store, a bigger display for that bus going forward. This particular bus is located at the Red Cross the main uh, uh, head center or head office in Oslo, Norway. And uh, I visited this bus a few years ago, and there they actually use it as a, uh, as a interactive learning tool for, for students of all ages. Uh, as you can see, this bus was set up as an ambulance uh, for the very ill passengers. Uh, what doesn't show in this picture that they had wooden benches in the middle and they could have <laughs> passengers on these buses. Uh, on the right, of course, you see the driver's seat and see the leather sofa on the left, and that's where the backup driver was resting while they were driving through the night. <laughs> when the former concentration camp prisoners came to the freedom in Sweden, some of them chose to return back home. Some of them didn't have any homes or family left, and some of them stayed, stayed in, in Sweden. Uh, I just want to remind you, everything you have seen up until this point, it started with a simple thing as a dog potato salad. Everything starts with a small thing, and I, I, I hope I can inspire someone here in the audience like I was inspired by this story. Sometimes that's all it takes. Next, let's meet Zygmunt Lakrosinski. In times of difficulty, true heroes emerge. Heroes sacrifice their time and even their personal safety to help others. United by empathy, their legacies are eternal. This is the story of Sigmund Lakoczynski. Sigmund Lakoczynski was a Polish lecturer at Lund University in Sweden. The Polish government in exile asked him to gather information about Nazi atrocities in Poland and other occupied countries. Lund became the center for the collection of all material, where an archive and library were set up. Throughout the war, Valuable information was forwarded to the Polish government in exile and the Allies. The Holocaust victims first arrived from Sweden in April 1945. There were many Polish women rescued from the Ravensburg concentration camp. Sigmund Akoczynski offered to interpret from Polish to Swedish. The women told him that they had smuggled papers and secret documents from the concentration camp. They also brought objects that they had made, received, or found. 
During their internment, they had hidden the items under their clothes, shoes, in the barracks, or under straw mattresses. Zakochinsky immediately knew it was important to preserve these items as evidence in the future. He had the insight to understand the value of these women's stories for future generations. Sigmund Lakochinsky created what is now known as the Ravensbrook Archive. His foresight helped convict some of the Nazi war criminals in the Ravensbrook trials held December 1946 through January 1947. Because of Sigmund, we now have incredible first-hand stories of what the women at Ravensbrook had to endure. Through the power of the women's stories, we can ensure that the atrocities never occur again. I think you got to explain what this building is. So it's a stone throw from here. This presentation is geared towards the US audience, but you are very fortunate. We're just a few steps away from Lund University Library where the archive is located. Also, a few other, few more steps south of there, you have access to Kulturen, where there's actually an exhibit, standing exhibit about Ravensbrück and some of the items you saw in here, probably, probably on, on display there as well. And for those who are interested to research more about the library, if you don't want to go there, we do have a link on our webpage, better-futures.com, where you could go in and, and read the, the uh, interviews that has been translated and see the objects and look at the passenger list and so forth. Again, I just want to remind everybody, <laughs> if it wasn't for a job with potato salad, none of this would have been possible. The incredible archive that's uh, 513 or 514 interviews that will be around forever for future, for future generations. Again, if it wasn't for Wanda's kind act, of one just wanted to feed one hungry Norwegian prisoner, uh, he wouldn't have taken place. Again, just want to revisit Wanda Jurt, 20 year old Norwegian held under house arrest uh, outside Berlin, did this kind action that gave that created the list of 6,000 names that fought to burn out, used as a map for the rescue action to the volunteers that risked their lives. Actually, we're going to hear more about another bus driver that Roger's going to present on uh, in a few minutes. And also, you have now met Sigmund Lakwazinski. As I mentioned earlier, Roger uh, and myself, we are both on the board of Better Futures. Uh, Sigmund's son, Martin, is actually also on the board of, our, of uh, the directors of Better Futures. Young people should learn that they should be more tolerant to each other, that we should be uh, trying to help each other and not to be enemies to each other. I mean, just because somebody is a different nationality or a different religion that or different race, we should be human. We should help each other. And this is how I, I think it's important. That was a message from Ivana to the young people. And of course, we all belong in that group. So I hope you don't mind, but I'll play one more time. Young people should learn that they should be more tolerant to each other. That we should be uh, trying to help each other and not to be enemies. To each other. I mean, just because somebody is a different nationality or a different religion that or different race, we should be a human. We should help each other. And this is how I, I think it's important. The message is timeless. Unfortunately, Brana should passed away in 2018, and I feel very honored to have met her and got to know her as well as as uh, Elsie, something that I will carry with me forever, of course. And all the material that I've shared with you so far have been the basis for Better Futures program. We call it White Fuss for Better Futures. Uh, the program was born out of the material that you've seen, 
and it has been approved by the Sarasota County School System in Florida, where I reside, and we do deliver our program to high school students in the U.S. Uh, at the same time as we are delivering this incredible story that nobody, nobody knows about in the U.S. The program is White Plus for Better Futures. It's a character building program. Inspire tolerant attitudes and collaborate behaviors while at the same time encouraging community contributions. Based on the historical context of the Swedish Red Cross White Plus rescue mission in Nazi occupied territories at the conclusion of World War II, it offers exclusive education materials about a uniquely significant historical event. Promote social, intercultural, and civic competencies. Inspire more responsibility, empathy, tolerance, and inclusiveness. Here are some of the sources for my research since 2015. Some of you in the audience might find your name there. Thank you for the inspiration of those who find their names there. And uh, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Question and answers now. We will pass it over to Roger and the Q and A afterwards. Thank you, Richard. Uh, pass it over to Roger. Or what yeah. do you think? No, it's it okay for you. I'm, I'm absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Over to your, Roger. Sure. Welcome. Take a moment and stand because I get to plug my computer in. I am Roger Riffo, and I am totally honored to be here today. And it was quite remarkable that this is actually happening uh, through Zoom and the internet. We have been able to arrange this, and we are most grateful to our hosts to make this happen. There's a part of me that's a little nervous talking about a Swedish historical event to people in Sweden from an American perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I have learned is that this is not a well-known incident. These events at the very end of the war have nothing to do with winning the war. They just have to do with saving 30,000 people's lives, humanitarian effort at its best. And so perhaps that's why history doesn't record it as much, because it's not one of the great battles. It's not a victory that you can plant your flag on and say, we won. But clearly it changed the course of generations of people's lives. The irony or the coincidence, and maybe there are no coincidences, is that this is April 25th, 19, uh, 2023. <laughs> April 25th. 1945, 78 years ago, is a very important date which we are going to focus on. Five things happened that day. Well, a lot of things happened today, but five things of importance. It was actually the first meeting in San Francisco of what turned out to be the United Nations Conference leading to the development of the UN. And there's a whole history of the League of Nations and all of that. But the actually original conference was on this day, 1945. The US and Soviet troops actually met at the river, Elba River. And as Richard mentioned, the Soviet troops scared the Dickens out of people who, on whom they were advancing. And that was part of what led to the extra chaos at the end of World War II. On that same day, Mussolini and his mistress actually tried to flee Italy for Spain. They knew the war was over and he knew he was in need to get out of there. He didn't make it. And I think they hung him with piano wire. <clears throat> um, April 25th, 1945, the Allies sent 300 plus planes to bomb Hitler's Eagle's Nest. Complete control of the skies over Germany and Nazi occupied territory at that point in the war. And an RAF Royal Air Force plane strafes the white bus convoy that actually kills one of the bus drivers named Eric Ring. And I will come back to Eric 
in a few months. Bentley's Eagle's Nest is down here in Germany. This is approximately, I guess, where the river is, where the Soviet American troops met. And up here is the road where the strafing of Eric Lindman and the White Blast Convoy took place as they were happening. Picture from the San Francisco Conference, 46. They say 46, I also read 48. There's a, I'm not quite sure what the actual number is, but this is a picture of the first United Nations Conference, and you may notice they're almost all men. Uh, Hitler's Eagle's Nest, they bombed that. This is what it looked like before. Pictures from the bombing, explosions, and it actually turned out that they didn't really destroy the Eagle's Nest. They bombed just kind of all around it. But symbolically, it was critical for the Allies to show that they could penetrate into Hitler's literally inner sanctum. Um, Richard has given a really good overview of the history of how Himmler and the Count worked together to make this happen. There are a lot of stories about how good, how great, or how egotistical the Count was. Some people looking back on the history, as I am learning, feel that he overstated his own role. I'll be very clear. Whatever he did deserves praise, from my perspective. Did this crazy end of a war with everything up in the, literally up in the air and no one knowing exactly how it's going to end. They just knew the end was coming. He managed to figure out how to negotiate and save 15,345 lives on the white buses, over 30,000 when you count the trains and the white boats uh, and the Danish Red Cross coming in as well. Why would Himmler want to do this? What's in it for Himmler? Some people believe that Himmler was trying to show that the Nazis weren't all that bad. You may have remembered the Swedish Red Cross and the International Red Cross are connected. The International Red Cross did the Nazi propaganda film at Theresienstadt to show that it was actually just a nice relocation. It was all fake. And so the Red Cross got duped. And maybe one of the reasons that the Swedish Red Cross was able to do this is because of their history with the Red Cross. Himmler thought maybe he could plan an escape. There's evidence to show that he was possibly thinking of trying to negotiate for a surrender to the Allies. This white bus rescue was done without Hitler's knowledge. They were afraid Hitler would have said no and kill as many as you can. So Hitler may have been trying to save his own skin and perhaps show that he was more of a humanitarian. For whatever reason, it happened. And maybe all of those are true at the same time. You've seen some of these pictures of the white bus convoy, obviously taken before the white buses became white. These were the, these were the vehicles, and they were designed to be white under Himmler's orders so that they would not be strafed by the Air Force. They should be identifiable. It was, as Richard, I believe, mentioned, it was at least one Nazi guard on every bus while it was going through Nazi-occupied territory. That led to, you know the phrase, the fog of war? Crazy things happen and no one quite knows exactly why. There were plenty of documented stories that the Nazis were on either the actual white buses or with some fake white buses that they painted white with red crosses and Swedish flag on them so that the Nazis could escape, knowing that the white buses might be safe. So, yes, there were, there were Nazis on the bus, but they were there as guards as the bus proceeded up to the Danish border. So it is possible that the British Air Force thought that these were Nazis escaping in fake buses. I have read the mission reports from the strafing on April 25th in the British Military History Library, uh, 
not in person, they send them online, it's kind of nice. Um, and it's clear in the after action reports that the pilots had to file that they knew they were bombing a convoy, but they did not know who was on it. And I don't think from the pilot's perspective, we have to know who was on what you wanted. Uh, the left picture is a sketch created by passenger on the white bus and actual photographs. I just always like those because they they're well. Uh, actual pictures of people on the white bus being transported, receiving care. I have seen the white buses. There's one you've probably seen it as well in the Mama Museum. How they get 40 to 50 people on there is beyond, I mean, it's triple deck and they are tight. Uh, I can't help but laughing. Behind the bus driver's seat is a little bench for the relief driver to sleep or nap. This is not a highway that these people, I don't know how you would lie down and sleep on that bus. I mean, these are on bond roads. And so this is not a comfortable journey by any stretch. The buses now in 2023 were pristine and cleaned up and nice, but if you picture what the bus might've been like with the sounds, the smells, the medicines, the latrine, they get heavy bathroom system. Um, the bus arriving, some of the video did show that um, the prisoners were deloused, given medical exams, given clean clothing, and actually, I mean, clearly a staged photograph, but this is taken in the Mama Museum, which was converted to house <laughs> the newly released prisoners. I just love the fact that they're reading Time magazine and looking like they're casual. But imagine the whole the whole hallway filled with beds and bunks. And what the Swedish people did in Malmo and in other cities and opening up their arms to welcome is in stark contrast to what my country did when the SS St. Louis was turned away and would not take in refugees from Europe during the Second World War. So it's a very welcoming scene, even with all the chaos. People of your country in this city did open, this area did open up their lives. Vittorio Martinez is a historian who's written a lot about the camps here and the process. Mm -hmm. uh, she's also a doctoral student, I believe, here at the university, and I'm going to be with her next week when we're going to resettlement camp, repatriation camp called Dovastorp outside of, am I pronouncing it right, Norshipping? It's a little long, but it's worth, let me read it to you. It's got a lot in there. All came to Sweden to some degree physically, broken to some degree physically and psychologically. The Swedish media reports on the arrival of the survivors are filled with descriptions, skeletal, filthy, tattooed with serial numbers, dressed in rags and prison clothes with the various designation, degraded to animals. And we know this happens to prisoners in all kinds of horrific situations. 90% of the United Nations UNRWA refugees had, had tuberculosis, quarantined for at least two weeks, hospitalized for much longer. Quite a few didn't survive their rescue as evidenced by the cemeteries here in Lund. I don't, Richard will tell you the name because I don't know how to pronounce it, but there's a cemetery we went to yesterday, which is called- That was the one, the Mill Ash Hill. Oh, it's this one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. There is about 30 graves of some of these survivors who repatriated and lived here and then died in Sweden. Some died literally months after they arrived and some lived in, you know, years after that. But there is a section of that cemetery with it interesting statue uh, right here. So uh, this does ground it. But Victoria, Tori really captures what that scene must have been like. A bus driver who's supposed to be rescuing people couldn't take it. With all his training and as a military person, too much for him. And that's, that's a human reaction to an inhuman situation. Dovastorp? 
was not built to house the White House survivors. It was built years before that to house approximately 7,000 Estonians. And it was the largest repatriation camp ever in Sweden. Now, this is where I get into language problems. Some of the material refers to these camps as resettlement camps. And I have been told by uh, some people here and have read that they, are, they were really repatriation camps. That the idea was that Sweden would welcome, nurse back to health, clothe, et cetera, and then help these survivors return to the country from which they came, to their homes. Resettlement implies coming and settling. Repatriation implies coming, being attended to, and sent. And people from the white bus rescue and the white boats were returned, some immediately, to France and other European, you know, their homes. So Sweden was willing to welcome them, but it wasn't clear that they wanted them to stay. Uh, I don't know if it's two out of all the refugees survivors who were came here, or two out of the 514, I believe the number is, interviews that are in your library. <clears throat> but two of them, at least in one of those statistics, are Roma. And Roma don't have a national home very often. And Sweden, I believe you all had laws in 1952 or 54, I believe it's 54, mm -hmm. that Roma were not allowed to settle in Sweden. If any of you know that, it was, it was it's either 52 or 54. So the few Roma who had a very low survival rate in the camps, because they were really low on the hierarchy, uh, the few who did come were not supposed to stay. But apparently, you also have a law at that time that you couldn't return somebody to another country unless the country was willing to take them. So the Roma were kind of caught in between. One of the Roma, I do know, because I've read the translation of some of the book that this woman wrote, stayed, worked, married, and lived in Sweden. Uh, so, but these were repatriation kids. And this is what some of Doverstorm barracks look like. It was abandoned shortly, at two years after this, and totally taken down. But while it was operating pictures, they had food, they had dining rooms, they had water, they had an infirmary. But from the prisoner's perspective, unfortunately, barbed wire was put up. There was no barbed wire before the white bus refugees came, survivors came. Why would they put up barbed wire? To keep people out? because the townspeople were coming to see and bring clothes and talk, whatever, and to keep these survivors in because they weren't sure that they were totally nursed back to health and might still be spreading tuberculosis. They had dysentery, typhus. So they were clearly uh, sure, positive, that they were totally healthy. So the barbed wire served to keep out and keep in. Some of the interviewers, in the interviews, they were not happy about the barbed wire. They had just left barbed wire. And here they've been welcomed, and now they're behind barbed wire. Yes, it's a different scene. They're not there to be ex exploited and killed, but it created some trauma that is documented. Dovestorp, like some of the other, the other camps, did provide medical and dental care. There's some interesting documentation here, uh, here being in Sweden, not up in the uh, in Stockholm. Uh, requests for dentists. One dentist left, and one of the camp commanders needed from Dover needed another dental assistant or hygienist because these prisoners, these former prisoners, had huge dental problems. And we've all had dental problems, and you know what happens when it's not treated. It's it takes over your life. Uh, they did have limited counseling to help people deal with trauma. 
These are people who have been abused, punished, raped, assaulted, lost family members. There's a local Chabad group, apparently in North Shipping, about which I am not learning much. But Chabad is a part of Jewish religion, people who Jewish religion, and I'm Jewish, we do not proselytize. Chabad doesn't directly proselytize, but they are very welcoming of others, other, of other Jews who may not be a member, and of non-Jews. And Chabad reached out to the prisoners, former prisoners, in Dovastor with food, clothing, helped some of them get jobs outside of the camp, Help some of them get settled outside of the camp, which was part of the process. Uh, so the local Chabad group was a really part of a community organization, as well as other local citizens individually in groups. So the former prisoners in Dovastorp were not were not isolated, and that's one of the misconceptions that people had: is that these people were segregated and housed to be invisible. No, they were housed to be resettled and they. Right after the arrivals, Alva Murdahl, Guru Murdahl's wife, visited the camp. And I actually did not realize until I did this research that she was a Nobel laureate. Not for this work, but in the 1980s. And she issued a public report to the government that had four major components. Four major components. The first, the quality of the food. I used to be a university vice president, and I used to be an associate director of a hospital before that. Um, people complain about food, institutional food. But apparently, the quality of this food was almost to the, not just quality, but it was almost unsanitary and was spreading other diseases. So they quickly pounced on that. Uh, for the, about a third of the prisoners were Jewish. Not all of them, but many of them would have liked to have started practicing Judaism again and would, would have liked kosher food. How do we accommodate that preference? She mentioned that. Programs were needed to help prepare for life in Sweden if they stayed. Well, you know, some of these people had professions. How do they practice their profession? Some of them wanted to go back to their original country. How do we plan to get them repatriated? Now that you've got them, what are we going to do? With them? Was the question that she raised. The third thing was, especially among the Polish refugees, virulent anti Semitism. So while they may have all been prisoners together, some of those early views and the anti-Semitism anti still remained. And she was aware of that, and she felt that they needed to, uh, the camp authorities and government officials need to fight this. And I believe the word she used was toxic. I don't think I put that in there. I think that's actually should have been a quote. Uh, to stop the anti-Semitism which was part of the Nazi ideology, part of Polish culture and history. Uh, and so her report didn't exacerbate the closing of Dobrostor, but it did draw attention to the fact that this was not paradise and that there was a responsibility that this country has, has uh, taken on and to the Swedish government's and I guess I say national government, but it might have also been local. They did organize and attack each of these problems. It, it, this is not a report that ended up in some file cabinet. Dovastor today is apparently very, very little is left. There are some water pipes, the potato cellar on the right. Uh, this is not a barracks. It was a, I forgot what that was. And he's, this is like the water pipes where the showers would be or running water. Just more pictures. I'm actually going there next week. I was supposed to have gone when I was here in September, but 
He had a family that tragedy. April 25th, one of the bus drivers is named Eric Ringman. This is a picture from his passport, and this is his passport application. Volunteer bus driver. In his family, there is a story that he volunteered for military service to take the place of either his father or his grandfather. It's not clear that how that happened, uh, if that's true or not, but he was engaged at one point, never married to the best I can determine, and there's nothing I can find about who his fiance was, and it's not clear that he was engaged when he went into the military. But since he was single, the family story is that I've been told, I have told, uh, the family story is that he volunteered since he was single male, single male not having a family. Because he was a bus driver going into Nazi occupied territory, he needed a passport. And this is his passport application. What's interesting, it is dated March 3rd, 1945. 53 days later, he gets shot and killed. So he gets the passport. And that's his signature um, from the military records here. He was shot and killed, and some other passengers are wounded. And there is a very large national, at least local, if not national, understanding that this is a tragedy. This is pictures of his vehicle coming back that he drove, and it's carrying his casket. Casket is getting loaded on its way to the church for his funeral and burial. And here's a memorial marker can't read all of it. Swedish. Eric Ringman. This is the church where Eric's funeral was, and appreciation to Marie Magnuson for sharing this photograph with me. Little dark. Marie's mother, Marie, my graduate student, and me looking much younger, um, seven months ago. What is interesting, and what makes this story give me hope for the future and makes it not so historical from 78 years ago, is Marie is sitting in the audience here today. And I would like to acknowledge mm -hmm. uh, I tracked her down online one night, three in the morning. I go, no, I'm because I was interested in Eric Ringman and how this happened. And you know how internet stuff works. And suddenly it's three in the morning, my time. And I, I found her email address and we corresponded and arranged to meet last September. And she was kind enough. You live here in Lund or nearby, yes? Sadly. Which is close. Eight minutes, eight minutes. Ah, okay. um, and so uh, I am thrilled and honored to see you again and have you here. Uh, and so suddenly this piece of history for me becomes current day and personal. Sadly, Eric Greenman is not the only one who was brought home in a car. Unrelated to the white bus rescue and the negotiations with Hitler, you probably are aware that the count was shot and killed in Israel. When you walk into the Stockholm airport, there are these huge black and white photographs of famous Swedes, Abba, Jan Borg, uh, etc. He is listed, his picture, his photograph is up there, so is Raoul Wallenberg's. And I believe it says international diplomat or international media. He was involved in the early 
official UN delegate, mediator to the Arab, Palestinian, Israeli developments. And there was a rumor, apparently, that he was in favor of what we would today call a two state solution. Turned out that that was not his position and it hadn't been for six months, apparently. But the Stern gang in Israel didn't know that. And they assassinated him and his driver and some other people in the vehicle. So he also came home in a casket. And I just find that that gives me goosebumps because he was such a humanitarian. And I shared my view earlier on his role in all of this. Uh, wouldn't have happened without him. <clears throat> Uh, and yet his demise is a tragic ending for both Eric Ringman as a volunteer and the Count, both of whom put service above, above sacrifice. And I think that's a, a lesson that I take from the potato salad. Um, just to note, these are my two graduate students. That's Caitlin and Allison. Uh, who helped me with this project and do the research. What's interesting about these two women is they are so typical of graduate students of traditional age in the United States. They know nothing about the Second World War. They knew very little about the Holocaust. They certainly had never heard of white buses. They probably didn't know much about Raoul Wallenberg, never mind. I don't even think, I don't even know if Schindler's List came out when they before they were born. Um, so this was new to them. And as they got into it, they got energized and they started telling their friends. So I think people do get inspired by the story. Uh, but I do want to thank them. My two universities, I was the administrator at Auburn University, Montgomery Provost, and then that full time faculty. Now I'm part time. AUM, and I still teach at the University of Colorado, Denver, so both of them deserve a thanks. Richard and I thank our two hosts. I hope those pictures are okay. I got them online. <laughs> uh, and all the staff at the university who made this possible. This university and its connection to Robin's book is not anything I knew about. And I have found the people here in the archives and across the campus to be welcoming. I have found when I went to Robin's book, the people at the archive knew we were coming, had pulled out a ton and a half of material for us to read. Um, I went personally a day early before Caitlin and her, her husband arrived because I had not been to Robin's book. So I spent the day at Robin's book just as a visitor to the camp. And then when Caitlin, my grad student, came, I spent that whole morning in the archives and she and her husband did the camp and then the three of us knew what we were looking for in the archives but to have that archive and those history those inter historic interviews here is an international resource that is um, spectacular and it's publicly available there are other archives online that you have to register and go through all kinds of approvals to get access to which i've done it's not a big deal, but you just have to do it. This is a publicly available archive. And the fact that the testimonies that the nine interviewers were able to document were used in a war crimes tribunal shows how important their work was in documenting this history. So what we are doing today, what Richard and I have been, will do, is try to keep this history alive. And I thank you for your attendance and presence. And I do like to uh, say to people, let us never forget. <laughs>